Hey everybody, welcome to the second episode of Forensics Talks. My name is Eugene Lisho, and I'm a 3D forensic analyst at AI2-3D. Uh, forensics Talks is a series of interviews with forensic professionals to discuss their, their work, technology, uh, current issues in their respective disciplines, and just to have good conversation about forensics in general. Um, today, uh, we're going to have Matt Nodell, and before we just get him on, I'm just going to, or get him on, we're just going to do a couple, uh, little announcements here. Uh, first off, so Forensic Talks, just so you know, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. So if you can, uh, please, uh, subscribe. Um, this is informal. It's not scripted or anything like that. So Matt and I are just going to have a discussion. Uh, if you are, uh, on right now and you want to just type in where you're from. It's always good to know where uh, people are located and that sort of thing. So feel free to uh, comment in the comments section. Um, the other thing that I'd like to uh, make you aware of is that I'm having a shooting reconstruction week and uh, that's gonna be on the week of September 14. And what I'll do is I will just very briefly share my screen here and um, there we go. And you'll see that up on my website here, there's just a page that you can um, register. And if you head over to the website, uh, what it's gonna be is a series of videos. So there'll be like three videos that week talking about shooting reconstruction in general. And then there's gonna be a webinar on September 21st. And if you register here, um, you'll have access uh, to uh, all of those uh, videos and the material. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm going to back out of here and, um, our guest today is Matthew Nodell, affectionately known as Matt. Uh, we, a lot of people uh, call him Matt. Uh, Matt has worked as a forensic scientist for the, uh, Washington state patrol crime laboratory in Tacoma, Washington, uh, for about 15 years prior to starting Nodell scientific in, uh, 2005. Uh, he consults in crime scene reconstruction and analysis, uh, throughout the U S Canada, and even abroad, um, in Australia. He provides training in shooting incident reconstruction uh, in North America and abroad. And uh, last time we spoke, I, he was doing uh, quite a bit of work in Jamaica as well. He's also a distinguished member of uh, AFTI, that's the Association of Fire, uh, Firearms and Tool Mark Examiners. And he's the past president and past treasurer of ACER, which is the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction. Uh, if you know Matt, he's been involved in many organizations and he's played roles as president, treasurer, uh, a number of different things. He's very active in the community, uh, certified crime scene reconstructionist by the IAI. And uh, he's also authored several papers and uh, he's contributed to uh, uh, practical crime scene analysis and reconstruction. Actually, this book here, many of you are familiar with this one. And if you just flip over to chapter seven, uh, Matt's done some contribution there on the uh, on the shooting reconstruction part. Um, so um, let's see here. We worked together on some cases. I've known Matt for several years. And uh, I think um, the things that strike me most about Matt and why I think he's going to be a great uh, guest is that he's very inquisitive and uh, he has a passion for his discipline. And I hope that comes through in uh, some of the, the talks here. So without further ado, uh, Matt, uh, I think you're here and I want to say thank you very much for being here today and just to, just to talk. Great. Thank you, uh, Eugene. I appreciate the op opportunity to talk with you today. All right. Great. Well, I guess uh, I just want to start the, maybe a little bit at the beginning and uh, maybe give some background. Uh, there's obviously going to be some professionals here, some students, uh, different people that may want to chime in uh, either now or even later. Um, I'm interested in how you first got started. So I know you were at the Washington State Lab. Were you doing crime scene reconstruction right from the beginning or did you sort of migrate over? Um, Pretty quickly after starting with the state patrol, I was I was became a member of the crime scene response team as a uh, basically as a, a student mentor. Uh, I was mentored by the senior members of the of the organization. My career actually started a few years prior to that, um, where I was working in a private laboratory for, in forensic toxicology. Uh, so um, in the toxicology lab, we didn't do a lot of reconstruction, and we certainly were not doing shooting incident reconstruction. Uh, but uh, I, I, I got out of that, uh, uh, that job and right into the Washington State Patrol where I was doing chemistry and trace evidence analysis. And an opportunity came up with the uh, Crime Scene Response Unit and I took, took uh, that responsibility on as well. 
and have been in that continuously ever since. So uh, I'm about 30 years into the field of, uh, of studying uh, crime scenes and, and primarily shooting reconstruction and, and how to reconstruct events that uh, have involved the discharge of a firearm. Okay, and you've, uh, I mean, obviously you went private at some point and I'm just wondering what was the impetus to sort of move from there to, to your own practice? Well, the, the, there were a number of things uh, going on. Um, I had been with the uh, Washington State Patrol for 15 years, and and working as a private con uh, as a uh, private consultant was something that was always interesting to me. Uh, being able to run my own business and and uh, make my own decisions, um, so the time seemed right uh, when I left the State Patrol to uh, to go forward and uh, start out on my own. Um, I'd gained tremendous experience through my my time at the Washington State Patrol, so that served me very well. Um, ultimately, ultimately, it was uh, it was a decision where uh, I was uh, glad to begin to to run my own show and uh, and sample the, the water outside of the government business. Uh, government comes with a lot of baggage, of course. Uh, so it was nice to be independent and be able to call my own shots, work my own cases, and uh, make the decisions for myself. Yeah, no, absolutely, I, I totally get that. Um, what? How do you define? And, and I don't mean this in the in the literal sense, but how do you define shooting uh, incident reconstruction? Like, what does it mean to you, or uh, even you know what you thought it might have been at the beginning, and then what it sort of the reality of what it actually is? You, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. The thing to understand about shooting incident reconstruction, uh, it's often confused with recreation, and and recreation would be a process whereby you might make a movie to try to show how something occurred. Reconstruction, in, in my view of thinking about it, is using the science of the physical evidence to uh, test elements of a scene. Ultimately, you need to know what's being said about a scene, and um, you can use the physical evidence to then test those statements. So if a person, for example, says, I was standing at the doorway when I shot into the room, we might be able to reconstruct the path of that bullet and see, does it in fact point back supporting the witness statement or the shooter statement, or is the angle incorrect and the, and the shooter is uh, deceiving us somehow? Uh, so reconstruction is the act of using physical evidence in order to test elements of a, of a scene. Right. Uh, it's different than, than crime scene processing, which is where you gather that data for reconstruction. Do you do a lot of work where, um people send you evidence? So they're sending you clothing or, or, or other types of things to uh, look at and then maybe make some kind of determination? Uh, on occasion. Um, the, the typical case that I get involved with starts with a paper trail. Um, now as a private consultant, I no longer am quote unquote under the tape. That is, I'm not getting invited into the primary scene when maybe a, a victim is still on the ground uh, and we are still gathering evidence. Uh, right. As a private consultant, most of that work has already been completed. So I'm it starts by reviewing the available data. And sometimes that leads to the position where I want to see the actual physical items that we have. And one of the things that's interesting about reconstruction is an attorney who, who, who I may work for uh, may have a, a crime laboratory report that says, hey, this gun fired this bullet. And I'm not so much interested in the gun that fired the bullet. I'm interested in what does that bullet look like? Did it ricochet off of a surface or did it go directly into its target? Uh, did it collect fibers or tissue or hair or something along the way? Um, so the reconstruction is beyond just simply counting lands and grooves and microscopic comparison. It takes in the whole path of that bullet and how that bullet performed in the scene. Okay. I want to, I want to show you something here because, um, we, we were talking about this before, and I've actually seen these slides because you've presented them at a conference. But going back, I, I, because I do want to discuss technology and sort of the progression of, you know, kind of where things started out and then kind of where we gone. And this is going back a little bit farther, but uh, I'm, if we can show the, the two slides, uh, th this one here in particular, uh, what you know about this one. Yeah, sure. This is a, uh, this is a photograph taken by a, a photographer from uh, the, the uh, 1920s named Ed Tangen. Uh, he was out of Colorado and he was primarily a, a landscape photographer, but got involved with his local law enforcement department back in the 20s 
Um, and as a uh, as a top notch photographer, they realized that they could use his his abilities in um, documenting scenes where shooting events or where any event had occurred. Um, so the, the the whole research of of this end of things for me began with a, a clever attorney asked me where did shooting analysis start? Who was the first person to to connect? a gun to a bullet hole and say that's where the person was. And so in researching that, I came across uh, this data uh, that, that Tangent took. Uh, and Tangent took a, an actual photo. If we go to the previous one, Eugene, we, we see there's a string going over the shoulder of that, uh, of that actor yeah. and he's holding a rifle pointing it into the room. So this is one of the earliest times where I could actually find documentation of a bullet path. This is from 1927. Uh, where they were trying to estimate the path of a bullet as a straight line and using a string. Uh, in the next slide, a similar uh, process was used here. To the left of this image is a, a police officer who's kneeling down holding one end of the, of the trajectory rod or the trajectory line. We can see that the line goes through the car and up into the gas station. Another photo by Tangent around 1932. So we've been considering bullet paths as straight lines for a very long time, uh, almost 100 years now in documented history. There are a few references that go even older where probes have been put through a skull or something like that, uh, where, where people are trying to estimate the straight line performance of a bullet by the characteristics that it leaves behind, the bullet holes that it creates. And that's the gist of uh, bullet path analysis, which is one corner, uh, a big corner, of the uh, shooting incident reconstruction task. Yeah, for sure. And in in that domain, um, let, let's let's fast forward and maybe talk about the past twenty years, maybe or something like that, and how things have changed in terms of technology and the kinds of tools that you use to document uh, a, a a trajectory rod, a scene, or something like that. Um, what kinds of things are you using these days? Well, currently. Uh, the the uh, one of the most valuable tools is is 3D laser scanning. Um, it captures such an enormous amount of information that uh, we can go back. If 3D laser scanning was used to document a scene, we can go back and and get measurements years later on things that when we are first at the scene we don't even realize are important. But as we gather information, we we realize maybe a year or two later, the the height of the window, the height of the bed might be an important measurement. So in my career, when I started uh, documenting shooting scenes, uh, we had a tape measure and we had an old film camera. And you would kind of hope that your pictures came out because you wouldn't know until you took them to a developing lab. Uh, and our tape measures were just uh, used uh, to capture as many, uh, as many measurements as we could. So in a particular room where a shooting occurred, we might catch with our tape measure 20 or 30 measurements, certainly the the, the lengths of the walls, the height of the ceiling, those kinds of things. Um, so over time, we've gone from 20 or 30 measurements of a crime scene uh, by a tape measure to using to things like total station, where we could capture much more, many more points, uh, but still we had to go to individual positions within the scene and let the computer capture individual points. Then that leads to the 3D laser scanning, where now we capture the entire profile everything the laser scanner can see can be measured and documented. And so this progression um, didn't move much from 1927 to about 1990, uh, where we were still using strings as Ed Tangent photographed uh, through that whole time to where now we still use rods. Um, sometimes we use lasers in, instead of a rod if, uh, if, a, if a, a particularly long distance is needed, longer than the length of a rod. A laser is just a straight line. Uh, coming out of an instrument. So um, we've been using this technology for all of this time, and we're still using pretty simple tools like rods, uh, straight edges, tape measures, but now we're enhancing our abilities with 3D laser scanning. Okay. okay. Well, I want to want to come back to that. There's something that actually I want to show people here, and that are just some statistics that I was looking at, and sort of it relates back to the importance of shooting incident reconstruction. I mean, these are not... Uh, you know, these are not rare events, at least in North America and the UK and other countries. And I just brought up this table and it may be a little bit hard to see. Let me see if I can maximize this a bit. But if you look uh, closely here, if you look at these are um, 
uh, on the website here, worldpopulationreview.com. And uh, I was just, I just said, hey, let me look and see what kind of homicides we have or, or gun-related statistics. And if you look, Brazil, United States, over 40,000 uh, incidents a year, which is, you know, which is huge. And this is just a random sampling. These are not sort of like in, in particular order. Um, you know, but you know, South Korea, Japan, obviously much, much fewer in Asia, uh, UK about 155, you know, Australia 262, Canada 767. So I think the, the, the message here is that this is something that people are doing on a daily basis. And you can imagine if you are from New York City or if you're from Chicago, uh, unfortunately, these are regular occurrences. So um, being able to reconstruct these things are, uh, you know, are going to be really important. And, you know, I was even looking at the number of guns as well. You know, United States uh, getting 400 million guns. Uh, even Canada, I mean, you know, we only have a population of about, you know, 30, a uh, little over 30 million you know, we've got like, you know, almost 13 million guns. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's something that is very, very common and very needed. And, um, you know, we, we discuss the objective and subjective and how we can be more objective and how we can get more scientific with shooting uh, incident reconstruction. Um, where would you say we were um, in terms of really understanding fundamental you know, principles with shooting and incident reconstruction. And the only reason I say that is, it seems like uh, even a lot of training courses we go to, um, there's a lot of demonstrative stuff. So you shoot at something and then you you notice the pattern and then you shoot at something else and you notice what it does. Um, but I don't know how much of that translates into uh, a rock solid type of analysis. Well, I, I, think, I think we're just at the beginning stages of doing some backfilling of, of required data or data that's important for us to, to draw from. Uh, one of the interesting things about shooting reconstruction is it's very intuitive and everyone understands that when you fire a gun, the bullet goes straight down the barrel and straight on over a short distance at least, straight on to whatever it hits. And so uh, we, we have oversimplified that straight line. Now, certainly that's how bullets perform. But our task in shooting incident reconstruction, we don't get to usually see the shots occurring. What we're looking at is a bullet impact site downrange. And that's where the research is need to, needs to be filled in. How do we evaluate all of these different bullet impacts? Um, and we know going in that no two different materials really perform the same. For example, shooting into a, a rubber tire on a car is much different, creates a much different bullet path and bullet hole than shooting into the metal part of the car. Uh, and then the glass on the car is a completely different thing. So we have each of these categories just on shooting a car that could be hit, the tire, the side uh, of frame, and, and the glass. Uh, those three things each perform differently. That's three independent experiments. Then when we fold in the different calibers, velocities, and energies, um, we have we have just tripled uh, that process when we're trying to understand what's going on in tires, glass, and sidewalls, and uh, um, car metal. Uh, then we add, sprinkle in some building construction. Plywood performs different than does manufactured boards, which is different than drywall. Uh, again, with all the variables of, of caliber. Um, and then we sprinkle in things like hollow point performance versus full metal jacket, different projectile designs, uh, frangible bullets as opposed to bullets that are contained solid. So we have a tremendous uh, um, broad reaching variety of things that are struck by fired bullets, uh, but we, and we've, we've oversimplified by trying to push them all into the same corner and say, okay, uh, here's the numbers that we like to use and we like to give a range um, but really, uh, the empirical testing, I think, is, is, is very important for us to backfill. As you see um, in Tangent's photographs from the 1920s and 30s, uh, we're just putting straight lines to the bullet holes and drawing them straight back. Well, we have to be careful when we're looking just at the impact site that we are, in fact, drawing that straight line properly uh, and, and, and answering the, proper, the question properly. Um, 
the, the, the next level of that is because as attorneys begin to study more and more about what we do, uh, our requirements are going up and up. Attorneys are asking these questions. How do you know uh, the performance uh, of, a, of a bullet into a picnic table or through, a, uh, through an object that's never been seen, a ceramic lamp? <laughs> so the question becomes um, empirical testing is, is needed on many of these. And so earlier you asked me about getting physical evidence in my laboratory here. And, and yeah, oftentimes I will request the same type of ammunition, the same firearm, um, and actually shoot experiments to try to validate or refute what is what is being claimed in an event. Yeah, interesting. That's the, that's the tricky part. Uh, so we're just beginning to understand that uh, this is not a one size fits all uh, scientific subject, but I do believe it follows the scientific principles uh, if we adhere to those in our research. Well, and I think you just laid it out pretty simply that there's so many combinations of different things that testing is the important part here is that, you know, you, you, we can't just draw uh, general conclusions. You actually have to go back and because there's so many small variables that could play a large effect for sure. Um, what about, I'm interested in, in your take on also things like uh, comparisons, like bullet comparisons and things like that. Uh, the early 2000s, for example, there there were some wrongful convictions because um, some of the uh, bullet lead analysis stuff that was being done by the FBI, and there were some people names like uh, Patrick Bursley, uh, Philip Scott Cannon. These are people that you know got off, got off afterwards just because of the the problems with that type of analysis. And I think things have moved in a very uh, a positive direction. And there are, um, I believe there was even a, I can bring up my screen here. I'll show you something. Uh, let me go here. Um, there's an article from, um, let me see if I can bring it up here. Sorry. Can you guys see this screen here? Not yet. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, from an article that was online about uh, matching on firearms. And I thought it was pretty good because um, it shows how um, NIST is looking at creating more objective methods. And interestingly here, you know, I, I love things, all things 3D, but they actually, you know, have gone to a 3D method of, of uh, documenting the bullet or scanning uh, the cartridge case and, and, you know, coming up with some statistical methods. Um, I don't know if in shooting incident reconstruction, we're at that point yet when we're talking about trajectories, um, but I think the move to that uh, is, is, uh, is, is a positive move. But I'm curious on your side, what you've seen in the past, you know, 20, 25, 30 years with respect to comparisons and are there still areas that are problematic? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I spent a, a large portion of my time at the patrol on the bench I, was, I had a responsibility in the field to attend crime scenes and, and reconstruct scenes. On the bench, I was a firearm and tool mark examiner. So I was doing the actual microscopic comparisons. Um, like some of the reconstruction elements, the comparison science is, is going through some growing pains as well. Um, trying to uh, identify or, or determine exactly um, the significance of a group of microscopic pieces of information is a really difficult thing to do. And what I found in, in my experience is that there, is a, uh, there, there are groups of guns and bullets that everyone would agree are a match. That is, the amount of microscopic detail is so great that everyone would agree it's a match. Then there's a group that everyone would agree is a non-match. And what that leaves us is this uh, relatively small sliver, but still a sliver of, of, of comparisons in the middle that could go either way. And again, the same kind of problems I outlined in shooting reconstruction exist at the microscopic level on the surface of bullets and cartridge cases. That is, different brands uh, receive marks differently. Uh, there can be variability in uh, how guns mark. Uh, different batches of ammo have different thicknesses of jacket. Uh, copper versus lead, they perform differently and they may pick up different microscopic marks. Um, so using the, you know, what, what, what's going on here in the U.S. and NIST and other research areas, uh, trying to quantify what those matches are and, and what constitutes a match beyond just an examiner saying, eh, looks good enough to me, uh, and trying to bring that to light is, uh, is the area of big, 
topics and big research, and um, we are we are being challenged in my in my field. And I think that uh, uh, people who are who are like minded, we welcome that challenge uh, because you can in fact match things. We can recognize significances in in the population of fired bullets. We just need to find a good way to convey that the confidence and the and and uh, and have some kind of uh, degree of, of certainty to offer that 3D technology may be able to help with. Uh, algorithms can now scan the surface of a bullet and say, hey, I see X percent of similarity. And that in combination with a trained examiner uh, might be enough to convince a, a judge or a jury. Right. We have certainly taken a, a, a new look at how we save things, uh, where we used to say uh, years ago, we might say something is identified to the exclusion of all others. And people have asked, well, how do you exclude something when you haven't looked at all the others? Um, very good point. Uh, mm -hmm. so now we're, we're, we're honing in our uh, statements and what we can say about that to better reflect, I think, what we are truly doing through the microscope. And so um, the, the quality and quantity of matching information is something that we need to be prepared to defend. And uh, we don't need to be sensitive to it. We just need to be ready that this is, uh, this is how it is today, that we need to defend the science that we're using in uh, microscopic comparisons. Right. Well, you said a magic word there. And actually, I want to talk about that, which was research, testing and research. So um, I, was, I was having a look. And you actually published something, uh, Slam Firing a Calico M100 uh, a while back or whatever. Yeah. Tell me about that. So, um, as a lot of as a lot of the work, uh, a lot of the research that you that comes out of the forensic industry or the forensic uh, profession is based on on casework. Um, so, in the calico uh, design of of, uh, of uh, semi-automatic firearms, it's a very unique design. It has a big cylindrical magazine that sits on top of the gun, and the mechanisms that drive the calico uh, that that uh, make it function in semi-automatic. Uh, um, mode are such that at times a cartridge, a rimfire cartridge could get uh, misaligned and the returning bolt or the mechanism that slams forward uh, that's meant to push the cartridge into the barrel, uh, into the chamber of the barrel, actually would catch and crush the case and cause it to discharge what we call out of battery. That is uh, when, the, when the gun is not prepared to fire and send the bullet down the barrel. Uh, so in, in looking at that, we began looking at non-traditional tool marks. We're not looking at the firing pin impression and the lands and grooves inside the barrel. We were looking at the mechanisms around. And so uh, again, an on-the-fly research um, studies what part of the calico gun is hitting the cartridge case in order to initiate it to discharge. And we're able to find that by looking at the microscopic tool marks and then comparing that to the microscopic features on the actual bolt mechanism of the calico. Nice. Okay. There, there, there's, I had a, another interesting case at one time uh, back with the patrol where uh, a person comes in and interrupts a, an, a robbery going on in his house. And uh, the robbers had found the, the, the individual's firearm and were trying to load it in the process of, of him confronting them. Um, the, uh, the person let the slide go forward and tried to shoot the, uh, the, the home owner with his own gun uh, and at point blank range and it, it didn't go off. And so, uh, what had happened was the subject who stole the gun didn't know how to load it and they had actually put a cartridge in backwards. And again, a similar mechanism with the cartridge in backwards, the gun simply skidded across the top of the round and jammed. Uh, the entire gun up, the homeowner was able to overtake the uh, the, the subject, and, and everyone was was found, and no one was ultimately hurt. But again, a non traditional approach to tool mark analysis, which is actually uh, the broad uh, description of what we do with firearm analysis. Firearms usually looking at firing pins and lands and grooves in the barrel, but all tool marks, all parts of tools that come in contact with the surface, uh, can be evaluated and compared. Yeah, you've been doing now. You, you're also uh, a member of the IABPA, so the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysis, and I, I believe you've done some bloodstain testing and things like that too. Um, I'm just going to ask you more currently, or, or is there any uh, current research that you're working on that you can talk about, or, or some things that are uh, some things you may want to try in the near future, or, or that sort of thing? 
Well, yeah, there, there, there's. I'm, I'm always. I've always got uh, sticky notes uh, all around my desk of of ideas and things I want to per pursue. Um, I'm not really looking at anything in the bloodstain pattern area. The reason I like to maintain my bloodstain pattern expertise is because on every time people are shot, there's almost always blood. I say almost always because I have had situations where people have so much layers of heavy clothing that you don't actually see bleeding out uh, in the in the field. Uh, but areas within, uh, I like to look at areas um, that we have uh, been making claims about for a long time, but really have never backfilled the science to them. Um, recently, I did some research on, uh, I was challenged by an attorney in a, in a deposition at one time, and I was, I was challenged that the position of cartridge cases on the ground in a shooting scene were irrelevant because a car had driven through that, that scene and the car would scatter these cartridge cases everywhere. Well, that sounds right, but I realized nobody had ever tested that. So I began a series of uh, implementing a series of tests with my regional uh, forensic association called the Northwest Association of Forensic Scientists. And we began putting cartridge cases in the pavement and running over them with the tires of a car, of a fast moving vehicle. And what we found was very compelling in about 93% of the times, the trials that we did, the cartridge cases moved six inches or less from their original position. So what we found out from that was that just simply driving through a scene does not necessarily wreck the distribution of fired cartridge cases. Um, the video there, some of the video we shot, we did a number of trials with a number of different cartridge cases, different calibers, different designs. Uh, and we found that, that uh, they stay put, they stay put pretty well. Um, for the most part, so that we proved, or I felt I proved in this experiment, that that attorney's assumption was false, that they do not necessarily scatter into an undecipherable uh, range of, of possibilities. Um, extending from that, looking again at ejection patterns, I recently did some research with some people down in Oregon at the Oregon State Police. And uh, we were looking at documenting ejection patterns using 3D laser scanning. And so traditionally, when we evaluate where a gun kicks out its fired cartridge cases, we would set up a, an XY coordinate system with tape measures and physically measure how many inches over and how many inches back each cartridge case was. Well, you can see this is a very time consuming uh, effort, but with the 3D scanner, I can shoot a pattern, uh, let the cartridge cases land and simply scan their position, ca capturing all of the locations in one swoop uh, using 3D laser scanning. I can then take that 3D data, rather than me having to plot it on a piece of graph paper, I can now drop that 3D environment right into my crime scene if I wish. So if I have a distribution of cartridge cases in a parking lot, like in the case I described earlier, uh, I can test the performance of a, of a firearm uh, clinically in a lab, in, in a lab setting in a, at a gun range, scan that data, and now using all digital 3D scanning, drop that into my scene. Um, compared to 15 years ago, the best we could have done with that might have been to graph out on graph paper, uh, maybe make little models of little cars, matchbox type cars moving through a scene uh, and trying to duplicate it that way. So now our output has become so much more professional and uh, so, much, so much more detailed uh, that we were really looking at at these kinds of uh, research areas and validating things uh, with the data that we were able to accumulate. That's amazing, yeah, that's a great idea. I like the, uh, the idea of actually just documenting the, well, it saves you a ton of work, right? So, yeah. It does, and, and, and not to mention um, measurement error. So it, what, what, what one of the things we, ha we have to consider with uh, things like when I'm hand measuring, whether it be a room or a position of a cartridge case, the pot if, let's say the cartridge case is uh, is uh, uh, 100 inches to the rear and uh, uh, 98 inches to the right of my origin where I where I actually discharged the gun. Um, I have to make sure that I keep every angle at 90 degrees, and I have to make sure that where my crossing the tape measure is not at 92 inches; it's at 98 inches or 100 inches. The, the 3D scanner marks those positions accurately, and if my scanner is calibrated. I can now trace it. Um, so a much more robust uh, defensible position than my hand measurements where I 
I have one outlier that I'd simply write the number down and it was actually 108 inches over, but I wrote it down as 180 inches. That's a big difference. Right. So uh, the scanner uh, and, and, and documentation doesn't make those kinds of, of human errors that we, uh, that we can find ourselves in. Um, I want to ask you about, uh, for example, testimony and being, you know, at trial and maybe think about some of the more difficult situations or cases that you've been in. And when I say difficult, I don't mean uh, sort of uncomfortable, but maybe some of the, the, the technically difficult or more challenging where maybe something wasn't uh, fairly well understood. Or, for example, uh, you know, some in some cases when when the quality of the evidence is poor or is is mediocre then you start getting into some different you know some problems with interpretation and so i'm wondering if you have run into a situation where for example um somebody's been maybe overly aggressive on some of their statements or uh you know trying to say something about a piece of evidence or you know trajectory or whatever it might be um that just might be just too aggressive or, or maybe too firm for what we know today Sure, sure. Um, first, in, in the U.S. courts, uh, uh, obviously an adversarial system. There's a, a prosecutor who's trying to win a case and a defense attorney who's trying to also win a case and defend a, a client. Um, and uh, in my experience, those two people don't care if they crush Matt Nodell in the middle of that, um, of that argument. Uh, so going into court, you have to be very solid, very aware of what you're, what you're trying to say. Now, that said, what I found is some of the more significant challenges I've ever I've ever encountered in court don't come from these high profile cases where I study for, for months on end preparing for courts. They're in these little smaller cases where somebody hits just the right uh, line of questioning um, and, and, and uh, something that you're totally not prepared for um, can happen to you in, in, in court. So my experience with court, um, if you don't know, you don't know. Um, I see so many people get in trouble trying to dance around uh, something that they should know but don't know. If you, even if you should know it, if you don't know it, you don't know it. Um, some of the examples of, of, of situations I've been in, uh, sometimes there is tr a true misunderstanding of, of what the physical evidence can tell. Um, I've had challenges on, for example, gunshot residue, which is one product that is considered in shooting reconstruction. When you fire a gun, Residues leak out of the gun, might land on the hands of a shooter, but residues that are propelling the bullet follow that bullet for a short distance. The residues that leak out on your hands are different gunshot residue than those that follow the bullet. And um, I was in a court situation where we went around and around about whether the, the, the residues that follow the bullet are susceptible to wind and rain, which they generally are not. They have too much forward velocity but the light materials on your hands are subject to that. And so going around and around where the attorney simply didn't understand that there were two forms and it was never as simple as enough question, uh, as simple as a question is, does gunshot residue affect, is a gunshot residue affected by rain? You have to define which, which type. That's like saying, are your children smart? Well, I have two kids. One gets all A's, one gets F's. Uh, I can't say all my children are smart or all my children are not smart. There's explanation required. In court, you're often not given that opportunity to, to provide that further explanation. With shooting reconstruction, one thing I'll add is um, one, of the, one of the interesting things is we have to think about, it's so intuitive that we know bullets travel in straight lines out of, the, out of the gun. And we have to reinforce though, when we are at a scene, we're looking at an impact site and we're trying to backtrack where a gun was. So uh, I had an attorney once describe a bullet. He says, you mean to tell me when you gave an error rate of plus or minus a certain amount that the bullet traveled down range and then turned 10 degrees to the right? And I had to try to correct him and say, no, no, no. It's not that the bullet turned. The bullet traveled straight under the performance it could. But when I look just at the impact site, I don't know if this was from the, the lane straight behind him or the lane one lane over. Um, I don't have the benefit of knowing where the shooter exactly was, uh, despite uh, you, you wanting him to be in a particular position. So uh, sometimes you have to uh, uh, be aggressive and, and kind of explain the answers to, to what you want to get across, as opposed to just answering yes or no um, yeah. to some yeah. of the information. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, I think you 
you probably have something like this too, but I, I'm going to see if I can show this. But these are some panels on some of the, the testing now that we're working on where, you know, we're checking to see exactly what we were talking about, you know, how well we can do with, you know, determining uh, the impact angle of ricochet and, and other uh, you know, types of defects. Uh, this is a, this is a, I, I just grabbed these panels out of the, uh, these ones have a hole in my hand up through it. I'm not sure if you can see, but um, yeah, I think these are probably a 45 or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's a similar similar product here as well. So. See, <laughs> but it, it is an area of, of, of good study for sure. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's interesting, but we like to think that we can do better. But the evidence, as far as I'm concerned, shows we don't it's usually worse than what you're hoping you know what i mean unfortunately when you take a large sample you know across different people taking different measurements um you know yes. it's not as tight of a window as maybe sometimes we hope sometimes it can be actually and and sometimes you can do really well but depending on the situation there are just some instances you get into where you have some some difficulty trying to figure out uh, what the, what the the true quote unquote true answer might be Right. And, and a lot of that comes down to, um, you know, what is if we're going to work this from a scientific perspective, the, the information has to be reproducible. And uh, measuring humans in, in performance is a really difficult task. Um, uh, an two people can take the same course and perform in the field completely different way. And how you measure if an examiner in, say, uh, um, Florida is measuring a bullet path the same way as I measured in Washington, that's a difficult thing to compare because we both have different experiences, we have different uh, histories. The other thing, one of the reasons I like teaching uh, in a lot of the things that I do and, and courses that I offer is that I always learn something when I teach. And the reason I always learn something when I'm teaching is because despite my best laid plans, there will always be a shot that performs atypically to what I'm expecting. Um, and I've shared that with other uh, other instructors who say, you know, you shoot this uh, this this windshield uh, 20 times at 20 degrees with a uh, nine millimeter pistol, but on the 21st shot, uh, all of a sudden the bullet uh, came back and bounced back toward me, uh, something unusual like that. And that's another difficult area to capture scientifically the anomalies that we know can occur, especially when we're sending high energy projectiles down range and hitting variable structures, um, handling those, those anomalies um, when they, in, in a generalized situation, saying all bullets perform this way if they hit a car, all bullets perform this way if they hit an interior wall. Well, that, that's not true. Sometimes bullets perform in unusual or unpredictable manners. What's, what's what sort of complicates the, uh, the new construction. What would you say is one of the more difficult materials? Like, is, if, if you had to pick a material that was uh, one of the more tricky ones to deal with? I a, think a, I a, would a, say um, uh, human, human tissue, <laughs> human beings that are shot is probably one of the more, the more tricky uh, matrices um, as far as, as looking at performance. Now, that said, I do see reproducibility uh, when we compare likes to likes, that is uh, an in individuals that are shot directly, say with a nine millimeter hollow point, uh, the entry wounds look this very similar as opposed to say a bullet that ricochets. So there are general things that we can tell, but human the, the, the performance in, this, in the human body with all the variety of things that can be struck, uh, vascular structures, uh, skin stretching, uh, tissue, bone, uh, cartilage, uh, lung, heart, all of these different things have different densities, but the bullet plows through them all the same. And so we have to try to predict how does that work? And then we have to further consider what's happening to the bullet itself. The bullet leaves a nine millimeter pistol, say a thousand feet per second, uh, and it exits, goes through a body and exits, uh, if it exits at all, exits at a hundred feet per second. So where is it dumping all of this energy <clears throat> And what's happening when the bullet is moving very quickly, it is more stable and more of a straight line. But as things slow down, kind of like if you skip a stone across the surface of water, at the end of that, it ultimately falls down and sinks into the water. Well, a bullet can do the same thing. As it's running out of energy, is it, is it changing its profile, changing its direction? Whereby if we just connect entry and exit, 
we might be wrong because the bullet might have actually gone like this right. and and dive dove down. And we, we see that again in uh, ballistic studies when we shoot things like ballistic gelatin. We can see bullet performance in a body is not always linear. The next difficult thing is cars. And I mentioned this earlier. Uh, any given car has, has glass, rubber, steel, fiberglass, um, uh, plastic bumpers, um, car seats, car seat covers, plastic vinyl uh, center consoles. Mm -hmm number of objects that just make a can make a, a, a situation really difficult yeah well just glass alone can be uh you know uh, something that will make you go wow i didn't expect that <laughs> that sort of thing so uh yeah i don't know how well under i mean and again this goes back to my earlier comment where we do a lot of demonstration work uh so when we sort of have very very you know fixed and controlled parameters uh, like you said they may be repeatable but they're not always obvious either uh right. you know when, when looking at, at at different types of things especially with with glass um well we're getting up there i have one more question for you and i normally don't do this to people to put them on the spot <laughs> but but since we're talking about glass okay i want you to do uh, uh, uh explain this here <laughs> okay so if i were to reconstruct that <laughs> hopefully I, would, I would recognize that it's artificial um but if it were in fact a, a fired rifle bullet, I can see that's a rifle bullet that's in that's uh, 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 embedded into the glass itself. I would say that the glass was uh, that it had to be in a very hot environment to be soft enough, and the bullet would have to be moving very slowly. And I'd be right on a number of those elements because when they pushed that bullet into the soft glass, uh, uh, whether it was slow from falling out of the sky at a long distance or slow from them pushing it. Um, I might be right both ways. I think so. Actually, I, uh, Matt, uh, this was from, uh, I believe this was from the Acer conference in Tacoma, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. Yeah. We uh, we gave those out to our instructors and speakers uh, of which you were involved. And, uh, and so that's a, that's a glass for you to. Uh, Great idea. It's one of my, one of my favorites here. I, I, there, there's been a little bit of uh, cognac and, and, and scotch and whiskey in this. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting, um, interesting artifact. Excellent. Well, look, Matt, I want to say thank you very much. Um, hey, what can I say? Uh, yeah, it was, was great talking to you. Uh, appreciate all that you're doing, um, all the teaching, all the research, all the contributions, and the fact that you uh, share your information so easily. And, and I know from others, uh, you're also very helpful uh, you know, with them too. So um, I'm just going to finish off here, say thanks again, and uh, I'm just going to make some final announcements. But hey, have, have a great one, Matt. Thank you. All right. Hey, Eugene, thanks a lot. I look forward to working with you in the future. All right. Great. Take care. All right. So for uh, that was Matt. Um, I hope you uh, found that insightful. Uh, Matt's just uh, a really great source of uh, uh, of information. And if I can, uh, once again, if you want to visit his uh, his website, uh, it's going to be nodellscientific.com. So make sure you, you can get over. Uh, also, a couple of things. We mentioned um, some uh, organizations. Uh, so one of them was uh, AFTI, and um, that is the Association of Firearm and Tool Market uh, Examiners, AFTI.org. So if you want to head over there and have a look, uh, by all means, please do. And we also talked about the ACER conference. And so that's the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction. That's ACER.org. Now, uh, their next uh, conference is going to be 2021 on March 2nd to 4th. It's at Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I believe it's at the uh, the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, I also want to remind you that, uh, again, we're having the Shooting Reconstruction Week uh, coming up on September 14th. So make sure uh, you register. You can just go to ai2-3d.com and register there. Three videos. And then on September 21st, we have the, uh, the webinar. And finally, next week, so September 10th, it's going to be our third episode. And, um, you know, every time we do this, it's two or three. I thought, you know, today this is my second episode. So that's 100% more than what I had last week. Um, but we're going to have Alex Harvey from uh, Reality in Virtual Reality, RIVR. Sometimes I call it River. Uh, we're going to be talking about how forensics is used in virtual reality and some of the really, really impressive work that they're doing. So uh, tune in next week. And on that note, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Thanks.